I'd like us to um, start by breathing together. So let us bring our attention to our body, to our breath. Let's close our eyes. It's easier to focus so we wouldn't be distracted. Feel the in-breath coming in, the out-breath coming out. Feel the belly rising and the belly falling as you breathe in and out. Relax our shoulders, our neck. And offer ourselves a gentle smile to relax the muscles on our face to relax our body and mind. Relax our thighs, our legs. Take really deep breaths. Take in fresh air. to nourish our body with fresh oxygen and deep, slow out-breaths. To take out the stout air in the body, the carbon dioxide. And then we'll listen to the sound of, of the bell. Just allow the bell, the sound to vibrate in our mind, in our body, so that it can help to soothe our body, our mind, and heal our body and mind. Do you respect the Thai, dear Sangha? Today is the, the 2nd of June in the year 2017, and this is our second full day of the Mindful Cooking Retreat. The other day, when I asked the Sangha, if you come in here because it is a cooking retreat and only maybe three to five people raise their hands. And this is to say that we're here more than just to learn about cooking. We're here to learn how to take care of our body and our mind. And to concretely put, we're here to learn how to cultivate happiness and joy and how to manage 
our suffering, our difficulties, right? We, ha we all have this aspiration and this deep desire. And that's why we're here. The cooking is only an excuse, like I have said. A fun way to get us uh, to come together, to do something fun and to practice at the same time. And um, how do we cultivate peace and happiness and joy? And how do we manage, embrace, and take care of our suffering? As I'm asking this question to you and also to myself, I realize that Many of you probably have a lot of experiences through reading books, research, attending seminars, etc., on how to cultivate joy and happiness and how to manage our suffering because this is the deepest desire in us. We want to be able to live happily. We want to be able to know how to take care of the suffering in ourselves. And, um, but I think coming to Plum Village, it's different than just reading books or listening, uh, attending a seminar or going online and, you know, read these sites that write about these, you know, people's experiences. Because here, we actually have the tools to do them. And also, we do them together. We support one another to practice these tools in order to cultivate joy and happiness and to manage our suffering. They become something concrete and not just a theory or something that we have read. For me, if it's a theory or something that I've read, it's hard to really bring it into my life and, and make it a part of my life experience, my way of living. I need something concrete. I need to be able to do it, and I need the support of everyone to do it. This is, a, this is something that um, I think this is the reason why people are coming to Plum Village a lot nowadays. You know, you, you'll be surprised because you think that now that our teacher is not well anymore and he's not able to teach and he's not here, even in Plum Village, he's in Thailand now, that there would be less people coming to Plum Village, right? Well, it's the other way around. We have so much more people coming. Our summer retreat, um, after it's opened for registration, after three weeks, the Upper Hamlet is fully booked. And um, last week when I was in Italy, a lot of friends came up to me and were really upset, and they were complaining, how come I can't come in? How come registration is not open anymore? I'm sorry. You know, you have to be really quick, because there's just so much demand, and so, much, so many people come in, because for this reason, because we have the tools and we have the environment to, to apply these tools. But what is it that, that um, what is it that we are actually cultivating? What is, what is it that help with the cultivation of joy and happiness? What is it that helps with managing and embracing our suffering? What is, what is, I know there, there are tools, but what's underneath these tools? What are we trying to cultivate here? Anybody? Would you like to say what it is that we're trying to cultivate here in Plum Village?
something that's true with us, authentic with us. More than there's something more than just suffering, right? Yeah. Anyone else? Le mystère de la mort. Le mystère de la mort. The mystery of death. Anything else? Unconditional love. Love. The same thing. Unconditional love. Love. There's one magic word. Understanding. Compassion. Sisters? Any sisters? Sister Tai Yim said mindfulness. Awareness. Exactly. Well, all of you. Yeah. Coming in contact with our, our, our breathing. Um, you all shared. Um, This part of us, we call them seeds. They're seeds in our store consciousness. They're good, the beautiful qualities that we have in ourselves. And, um, and you all have mentioned like this different kind of seeds that are in there, these beauties and goodness that we have inside ourselves. And it is... Um, it is the three energies that we're cultivating to help these beauties and goodness to manifest themselves. The first energy is the energy of mindfulness, the energy of awareness. But what is exactly mindfulness? Mindfulness is just the energy of knowing what's there, this awareness of what's there in our body, in our mind, and in the surrounding. This knowing is like this inner eye. I call it the inner eye. Because once we close our flesh eyes, we can still feel it, we can still see. And it's like a light that once we bring this light into our mind, we experience life as it is, that it is no longer, that we're no longer dreaming, that we're no longer in our head, that we're no longer acting out of an automatic ways of being in the world, that it is a conscious, a deliber deliberate way of being in the world. And this light helps us to see. And um, once we light up this mindfulness, It helps us to see, it helps, to, it helps us to stay with that experience, whatever it is that's unfolding in our body and in our mind. A suffering, for instance, that comes from our mind. When we are mindful, it helps us to recognize that there is suffering. There is discomfort that brings that comes about with the suffering, the discomfort that happens on the bodily level and on the mental level. It helps us to recognize, yes, there is the suffering. And the longer we're able to stay with that suffering, with that discomfort in our body, in our mind, we're concentrated. This is the second energy, the energy of concentration. We're focused on it. 
We're not distracted. We're not trying to run away from it. We're there with it. We acknowledge in its presence and we're feeling its discomfort. And the third energy that comes about as we stay with that experience and we're focused is the energy of insight. The energy of insight. Insight is a deep knowing. It's not coming from our intellect or our head. It comes from this place down here. It's like a gut feeling, like this is it. It comes because our mind is calm and clear enough and we see. A metaphor that I really like to make this example clear is the image of a pond or a lake. That on a windy day or rainy day, when you look into the pond, you see ripples and waves. They're fragmented image of what's there, out there. And when it's calm and clear, like this morning, you look at the pond, and the pond is so calm and so still. You see reflection of the blue sky in it, of the trees in it. And, and our mind is like that. When we are agitated, when we have a lot of suffering, when we're anxious, the pawn of our mind are just ripples and waves, very dark. We can't see much in it. We become really confused. There are times in our life when the pawn of our mind become so dark that we can't really see much. We can't even see the light at the end of the tunnel. That ever happened to you? Anybody? Hmm. Yeah, many of us go through phases of depression. No matter how healthy we are in our body, our mind, we are going through that phase sometimes. And that's the time when our, the, our mind becomes so dark that we don't see why we're living. We don't see the meaning of our life. We don't see any light in our life. But when our mind is calm and still through the practice, through being mindful and concentrated, it becomes clear and it helps us to see really deeply into our mind. It helps us to see the causes and conditions that had brought about this suffering or this confusion or this depression. And that's insight. So it's not coming from the intellect or the head or from analyzing or speculating. It comes because our mind is so calm and so still And it comes from a very deep place inside ourselves. And that's the understanding. That's the insight. That's wisdom. And that insight can help to change the situation. That understanding helps to transform the situation and help us to be free from that suffering. So these are the three energies that we're trying to cultivate. And all our practices in Plum Village, from the, the very moment we wake up to the very moment we go to, bed, uh, to sleep at night, it's all about watering these seeds in ourselves. And the tools that we have shared with you so far are really to help cultivate these energies in ourselves. The energy of mindfulness is the energy that helps us to be truly awake. <coughs> And so, an enlightened one, an, an awakening one, like the Buddha, is someone who has this energy day in and day out. 
this um, this this enlightened person embodies the energy of mindfulness to its highest, to its highest. Our mindfulness is on and off, on and off. The days when it's not even on. <laughs> and so that's why we continue to suffer, fall into confusion or depression. And so in Plum Village, we come here and we're learning how to cultivate these energies because these energies help us to be truly alive and it helps to enhance the quality of our life and the meaning of our life. So the, uh, yesterday we learned uh, several ways to, to practice, to cultivate mindfulness, concentration, and insight. Because once we have these energies, the mindfulness and concentration in it and insight, happiness is there, joy is there, peace is there. Once we cultivate this energy, our suffering becomes manageable. It's no longer overwhelming. Our suffering is understood because these are the energies that help us to understand our suffering. It helps us to manage our suffering. But this morning, I'd like to share with you the practice of mindful breathing. We've heard about it already, but it, it sounds you know, so simple. Mm. A and yet, it, it's so <laughs> profound. I remember Tai shared that when he found out this discourse on the awareness of the breathing, he felt he had found treasures and that he was like the happiest monk when he found out that there's this precious treasure, precious discourse. And because it's so simple, it's e easily overlooked. People who are who are um, on a spiritual search or endeavor are looking for something deep and profound, something out of this world. But for us to be able to experience something out of this world, we need to start with something very, very, very basic something very, very intimate and very close to us, and that's our breath. And, and the reason I found for myself how, why this breath, the practice of mindful breathing, is so powerful, because I don't need to look for it anywhere. I don't need to run for it. I don't need to, you know, to get approval by anyone or compliments by anyone to get this, this because it's right there. It's happening all the time. It's my lifeline. And all I need to do is to acknowledge that I have, I'm having this lifeline, this breath which sustain my life that it's that is happening all the time. All I need to do is to acknowledge my breath. And so the Buddha offered the discourse on mindful breathing. And um, and and you can find this discourse in the chanting book. And there are sixteen exercises on mindful breathing. And, um, but today I'll share the first eight exercises because that's all you need for now to be able to cultivate joy and manage our suffering. So the first exercise is to be aware of the breath. How simple. 
those of you who have uh, who 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 are in who are into martial arts or other uh, form of um, exercises such as yoga or something like that know how important the breath is. And the breath is predated the Buddha's time. The Buddha only pick it up this breath and add the element of mindfulness to it the awareness of the breathing. And so, just simple as that, to be aware of the breath, to notice that there's air coming in, air coming out, as we have just practiced together. There's no need to, there's no need to try to control our breath, or to manipulate it in, in any way. There's no need to make it long or, or deep or short. Just simply acknowledge that, yes, there's this breath happening. And the miracle of being aware of the breath is that once you bring your attention to your breath, your, your mind quiet down. You notice that? Maybe try that and see why it feels. You're too busy focusing on your breath that your energy is not in your head. Your mind becomes really quiet. Most of our thinking are not very are not very necessary. Stories that we create in our head, daydreaming. We're so good at daydreaming, right? I remember when I was a teenager, and um, I was thir- turning thirteen or something, fourteen, and I remember the first time I tried daydreaming. It wasn't. It was deliberate because you know I was reading books and watching TV, and teenagers were like looking out the door, the window, and like dreaming about something else. And I thought, okay, let me do that and see what it's like. And it was really unpleasant. A- and yet I I took it up because it was unpleasant. But but in a sense, I don't have to deal with what's happening. You know, like the discomfort that's happening in my body, in my mind, as I was going through my teenage years. You know, the tension that I was having, the need for attention, for recognition from my friends, and you know, all this. So I was taking that up in order to avoid feeling all this com- discomfort in my body, in my mind. But my first experience with it was this is not very pleasant. Anyways, but some of us continue, right, to do this daydreaming, thinking all the time. Anything, anything except this, except here. So coming back to the breath, the moment we come back to our breath, this thinking, the stories, this association with this and that and this and that, quiet down, and we become truly present for ourselves. Love, true love, it's when you're there, truly there for the one you loved, body and mind. This is one of the mantras that Thay had offered to us. Darling, I'm here for you. You know, you say that to someone you love, you say, darling, I'm here. My body and my mind are here for you. And that's the that's an expression of true love. You know, you can love someone you say you love, but you're not really there to know what's happening in, to that person, whether that person suffers or, you know, whatever, and you're not really there, then you're not really loving that person. So to be able to, to truly love that person, your body and mind are there. And, and it made me think, well... This is a, it's a mantra. It's a mantra that I say to the other person. This is, you know, what about me? Do I say this mantra to myself, darling? I'm here for you. So, when we come back to our breath, we're really there for ourselves, and this is an expression of self-love. It's it's. 
the truest expression of self-love. I'm here for myself. And the irony is that it is only when I'm here for myself truly and love myself by being here truly that I can love the other person truly as well. Because if I can't love myself, then I can't really love other person. Even if I'm saying, darling, I'm here for you, but maybe I'm just saying it, but my mind is like there and there and there. So it's a practice of love in ourselves, but it's also a practice of loving other people as well, because loving other people depend in, depends on loving ourselves, on whether we know how to love ourselves or not. And um, the second exercise, follow the breathing. See, the Buddha had taught us very down-to-earth practices, right? Just simply follow our breathing. And that's not easy, huh? We think it's easy because maybe we're start, starting out, we are aware that I'm beginning my in-breath. But as we're taking in this in-breath, our mind is going over there to the other side of the planet. So we're not actually following halfway. Maybe we're following halfway and then we're lost. It's like going through a jungle and we're just completely lost. So we're following the beginning of our in-breath in to the end of our in-breath. Following the, end, the beginning of our out-breath to the end of our out-breath. Let's do that together. In-breath following, just noticing the in-breath coming in. <coughs> it's easier when we do it together like this for, for a few in-breaths and out-breaths, but when we are alone or when you are in meditation, with an in-breath and out-breath, we can be traveling to the other side of the world. And so, following the out-breath, out, in-breath and out-breath from the beginning to the end helps us to stay present. The third, aware of the body. So for the first, uh, when we do the guided uh, meditation for ourselves, as we sit or we practice, we say, breathing in, I'm aware I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I'm aware I'm breathing out. Aware in-breath, aware out-breath. And the exercise, second exercise, we can do the guided for ourselves following my in-breath from the beginning to the end. I breathe in. Following my out-breath from the beginning to the end, I breathe out. Following in-breath. Following out-breath. And then the third exercise, we're breathing in. I'm aware of my body. Breathing out, I'm aware of my body. The breath helps me to be present, to be able to recognize my body. Without grounded in the breathing, it's easy for me to take off. We're so good at that, right? We're so trained to take off at any moment, whether we want it or not, to take off, to fly away from our body. And so we need the breath as the anchor to help us ground it. So that's why in the guided exercises, we always started out breathing in, I'm aware of something, breathing out, 
I'm aware of something. So we're grounded in our, in, in our breath in order to contemplate deeper. We're grounded in our breath to contemplate that there is a body, that my body is present. And um, it's, it's, it's simple, simple, just being aware of the body. And yet, it can be so deep. If you want to understand deep Buddhism, you need to start with your breath and your body. You go into your breath and your body and you find out everything there is that you need to know about the teachings of the Buddha, about yourself, and about the world. It's all here. See, that's the beauty of a Buddhist practice, is that you don't need to go out there and look for it outside of yourself. You don't need to go to a teacher and bow at this you know, enlightened teacher and say, please give me some insight or give me some freedom, liberation. Because even if he might be giving you all this insight and liberation and if you don't do it, you can never make it yours. But the thing is that you can never really take it outside from outside. The teacher of the teachings of of a wise teachers are only to help us use them to come back here and discover these wonderful qualities in ourselves. So whatever, whatever it is that we want, we have to come back here to find it in our body and in our mind. And the sad thing is that most of us cannot accept our body. Even if we're such a beautiful person, even skin deep beauty, we can't really see that. That's right. We think that someone else is more beautiful. I'd rather, be, I'd rather be in her body. We are what we have. That's the gift of our ancestor, of our parents, of the whole cosmos, this body. And that we, we have to take really good care of this body, accepting this body. So coming back to our body, we're making this commitment to stay and to accept and to love no matter what. No matter if this body is a little bit heavy or way too thin or way too short or way too high. You know, we have an idea of what beauty is. It has to be like this, like this, like this. But if it's just like this or like this or like that, cannot accept it. And so being aware of the body means that I'm there and I accept whatever my body is without judgment or criticism, without trying to run away. And when we stay with our body, what we discovered is that all our ancestors are there in our body. Our parents, grandparents, great-great-grandparents, if we know them, in other words, we're just a continuation. This body is a continuation of this lineage of so many people who have gone before us, and this is the gift that they offer to us, this body. And that what they offer to us, they're good qualities, beautiful qualities, but also they offer to us Habit energies that, that is creating suffering for us right now. In other words, they pass on everything to us. 
But if we know how to take care of it by accepting our body, by being with our body, we begin to cultivate these beautiful qualities that they have transmitted to us. But we also begin to accept and practice to transform what is not so beautiful that have been transformed to us, trans transmitted to us. So it's, um, and if we look deeply into our body, we experience the insight of interbeing. Insight of interbeing. Interbeing is a, it's a word that has been coined by Thai. And it means that everything is connected to everything else that we are we are because of how our parents are, our society, how our society is, how edu our education had been, how our upbringing had been. So we are made of everything else. And if we look into our body deeply, we see that, in that insight of interbeing. We see our parents, we see our society, we see our, our upbringing see our education. We are why we are because of whatever we ever experienced in our life had been. Of people who enter our life, of the education we had, of the society that we were brought up, of the friends that we had. So, and this insight takes away the feeling of alienation and isolation I think that's the biggest suffering, that we see ourselves separate and alienated as if nothing is connected to us, nothing really matters, and as if we have nothing to do with people or, or them when they had nothing to do with us. I think loneliness comes because of this wrong idea that we are not connected to anyone, anything in the world, and that we're just one person struggling and fighting the world to survive. And that's sad. But when we experience the insight of interbeing by being with our body and looking deeply into our body, it takes away that feeling of loneliness, of isolation, of alienation, and that we feel connected. We're one big global family. That what's happening on the other side of, of the planet is affecting my life right here, right now. And you know, it becomes very obvious now with these issues of climate change, with this, um, you know, with this scientific discoveries of, for example, of quantum physics, you see how connected we are. And we need to cultivate that insight because it is with this, this insight that we can be free, that we can take away this idea of who we are, this limited idea of who we are. You see, we create this idea of who we are. We have this self-image. I grew up in the States. And um, somehow this idea of a self-image in me is very strong. You know, like, I'm like this. I'm like this, like this, like this. If you do anything that's not according to what I think about myself, then I'm either ready to fight or flight. You know, this, this natural response to survive because I d identify so much with this self-image of who I am that if something threatened this self-image, 
I feel like I don't have any ground underneath my feet, so I either have to stand and fight or I, I flight. <laughs> and then I, when I became a nun, I questioned, what is actually the self-image? I mean, is that really me? Like, there's certain things I think, that's me, but my sisters are always shining light on me about that. You know, like they say, that's something you need to change. <laughs> and so, um, but I thought, well, if I change this, what am I? I'll be nothing, right? Because I'm so attached and so identified to the self-image. You know, if I'm not this anymore, then what am I? I think this is like a big fear in us, especially for young people. And we always try to, you know, like to be our best to impress people so people can really accept us and accept this self-image we have about ourselves. So much suffering, isn't it? I remember just so much suffering around these issues when I grew up as a teenager and as a young adult. Luckily, I became a nun early in my life. <laughs> 23. And so that helped. That starts me on a spiritual, a spiritual journey to, to question myself about the self-image that I have and the suffering around, like, you know, trying to impress people, trying to get accepted, and, you know, all that kind of things that we go through as a teenager. So... What is the self-image? We'll talk about it. Well, if we understand, intervene, we know that the self-image that we have about ourselves is very limited. And that's a factor that creates suffering. And ideas we have about ourselves can be an element that creates suffering. But understanding insight expands ourselves. And we're much larger than these ideas we have about ourselves. Anyways, but that's for you to reflect on and contemplate. So be the practice of just simply coming back to our body and being aware of our body can be really healing for our body and for our mind. The fourth exercise, breathing in. Um, I take care of my body or I calm my body. Breathing out, I calm my body, take care of my body. When we're, not, when we're not there for our body, we neglect the, the calling of our body, the SOS messages that our body is sending us. In other words, there are tensions and pain in our body. And because we're not really there, we don't really take care of it. And some of us have left our body neglected to the point where 
it collapses. We have, we develop illnesses or cancer. For some people, it takes cancer to wake them up that they have been away too, too far from their body and they have neglected their body too, too long. And when we are with our body, we can avoid these serious illnesses. But how, how, how is it that being with the body can avoid these illnesses? You see, mindfulness It's a powerful energy because when you bring this energy of mindfulness to something that is not well, for example, a suffering in our mind or even a pain in the body, it helps to embrace this pain. It sort of like it comes in and it works on this pain, it stimulates it. <laughs> and then it helps to lessen the intensity of that pain. And then eventually, it helps to dissipate this pain. Are you convinced? <laughs> Way, Pascal said, Way. Pascal has been in the practice for a long time probably had some experience of healing himself, physical pain, mental pain. But that's how mindfulness works. It's that when we are present, we embrace the suffering, it melts away. If we stay with it long enough, and we see when it melts away, we stay long enough, we're concentrated. When it melts away, it helps us to see why it had come about. And I have to say, certain physical pain doesn't melt away easily. But what it helps us is that it helps us to be able to live in peace with it and not to be overwhelmed and suffered by it, you know, to go into depression by it. Because we can live in peace, we can live happily, even if there's some degree of pain in our body and in our mind. And that we don't have to have a perfect body, perfect health. There's no such thing as perfect health. I was talking to my sister this morning, and she said, you know, of all the sisters in the New Hamlet, she thinks I'm the most healthy person there is. You know, even if I may be older than them in age, but I said, you know, when I turned 40, after I turned 40, you know, I had pain here and pain there. You know, back pain, shoulder pain. But it's no big deal. I mean, I don't suffer because of that. In other words, mindfulness helps me to live in peace, to manage this pain so that it, it's not out of control. And so... Mindfulness of the breathing can really help us to heal our body. But what happened is that it's not just the body we're healing. When we breathe in, when we calm our body, we breathe out, we're calming our body. It's not just about the body that we're working with and we're healing. Although I found the breathing in the body are the most concrete things there are for me to practice because they're tangible. The mind is more um, tricky. The mind is more difficult to grasp. And so once you live here and you're just learning how to take care of your b body and learning how to be with your breath, that's enough to take you far on your spiritual path and far on the path of healing and transformation. But once you are with your body, 
you're actually taking care of your mind at the same time. Because what happened is that mental states, your anger, for instance, your jealousy, your irritation, your despair, or your violence, the mental aspect, the mental states. But when they manifest, they manifest on the physical body, on your body. And you can actually localize them on your body. We localize them by being aware of the body and then see on our body where it is constricted and tight and painful. And we stay with that. whether it's on the chest or you on the belly. I have it on the belly a lot. Mental states, for me, manifest as a block in my belly. Do ever, you ever feel this block? I've asked the other time, but only a few of you raise your hand, and I don't believe you. Raise your hand if you have like this block that sometimes you feel like at your belly level. A bit more people this time. I'm not sure about the others. <laughs> anyway, so, and, and, um, and localize, try to see in your body where it is tight and constricted and stay with it. Stay with it with your breath. Breathing in, I'm aware that there's this block. Breathing out, I smile to that block. Or breathing in, I'm aware that there's this tension or this pain. Breathing out, I smile. We simply acknowledge that there is this block and there is this pain. There's no need to analyze it or to judge it or to run away from it. See, when you feel a bit discomfort, you know, we just simply go the other way so we don't have to deal with it by exiting ourselves and think about something else so we don't have to deal with the pain and the ache, you know, that's in our body. But this ache and this pain and this block, it's really manifestation of mental energy that's there. Sometimes anger, you can feel it here. Or in your thighs, I'm also another part of my body that manifests its mental formation or mental state of my left thigh, very tight. Anyway, so the more you sit with it, the more you breathe with it, it melts away. And so when it melts away, it transformed in your mind as well. So taking care of the body, you're taking care of your mind at the same time because body and mind are one. They're two aspects of the same thing. What happens in the mind happens in the body. What happens in the body affects the mind. And so we're, we're taking care of the body, we're calm in the body, but we are at the same time taking care of the mind. And then the fifth exercise, the, fun, the first to the fourth exercise, it's, it has to do with the body because the breath is part of the body. But the fifth to the eighth exercise, um, it, there are practices to help us take care of our feeling. The fifth exercise. Cultivating joy. The sixth, cultivate happiness. So breathing in, I'm cultivating joy in me. Breathing out, I'm cultivating happiness in me. Or I'm cultivating joy in me. The same thing. This is a practice. It's not auto-suggestion. You know, like I'm breathing in and I'm cultivating joy, but I don't feel really joyful in here. It's not about that. 
because it is really to this practice is really to help us to tap into the seed of joy and happiness inside ourselves. Because if the practice is not just about suffering, you know, in Buddhism we talk a lot about suffering and how to manage suffering. And sometimes people get carried away by that and they're just talking about suffering all the time. But they forget the other aspect, which is to cultivate happiness. Because if there's no suffering, what is there? Happiness, right? So, and the thing is that if there's no joy and happiness, we're not going to continue with the practice. The joy and happiness are the motivation that gives, that helps us to continue with the practice. It helps us to stick with the practice. Because after all, we're coming to this pra practice in order to find joy in our life, right? And if it doesn't, if it talks only about suffering, defeats my purpose being here, right? So that's why there are two exercises to help us cultivate joy and happiness. And so in the there are many ways to help us cultivate joy and happiness. But there are four things that the Buddha had talked about in the sutras that help to cultivate joy and happiness. The first one, and which we already talked about, which is um, Mindfulness gives rise to joy and happiness. This expression you, we, he, we see a lot in the discourse of the Buddha, Niam Shun Hila. Shun Hila. Dui Shun Hila. <laughs> so, the practice of mindfulness, it means mindfulness give birth or give rise to joy and happiness. Then it's concentration gives birth or gives rise to joy and happiness. Dui, which is insight, gives rise to joy and happiness. So, when we are Embodied by these three, three energies, mindfulness, concentration, and, in, and insight, it gives rise to joy and happiness. We don't, do any, do, we don't need to do anything else. They're a byproduct of joy and happiness. I mean, of mindfulness, concentration, and insight. When there's mindfulness, concentration, and insight, there's joy and happiness. Sometimes I wonder, why is that? You know, why am I mindful? It gives me joy and happiness. When I'm present, when I'm mindful, it must have triggered something in my brain. You know, some good hormones or something like that that makes me feel really happy. Well, there, there's a lot of research now, and one of those, um, it, it, one of the books that's written by a neurologist is called The Buddha's Brain. By Rick Hansen, anybody have read that book? Yeah. And then his other book, uh, his second book was called uh, Hardwiring Happiness. And it, the, the ways to really protect our brain, you know. And surprisingly, it's the mindfulness, concentration and insight that protects our brain because it helps us to build neural pathways that lead to peace and happiness and joy. As a nun, in my early years as a nun, this word letting go irritates me a bit because 
I felt like it's a denial of who, of who and what I'm feeling. You know, like I have like really strong sense of who I am, like the self-image that I have, like I had said. And letting go means letting go of myself, you know? It's like not accepting who I am, denying what I'm feeling. But, but because I have this irritation around this word that I have to reflect on, what does it really mean, letting go? And what I found for me is that it's about creating space. It's about creating space in my mind. Because there are things that, because I couldn't let go, I keep chewing on it. I keep ruminating on it. Sometimes it's like, you know, like a cow that chew this grass and then it regurgitate and it chew on it again and, you know, it's like that. Our mind is like that. We had like this problems in our lives, you know, conflict with this person or that person or these issues in our relationship, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and we just chew on this day in and day out all the time. And we can't put it down. And we don't have any more space in here. Because we don't have any more space in our mind, little things can drive us up the wall, can throw us out of our balance. And so it's about creating space in here. It's about being with my breath so that I don't have to dwell so much on these issues. Like I said, being with our breath helps us to stop this chattering in our head, the stories that we continue to create about ourselves, about other people. And so being our, with our breath helps us to put these issues down. And there's no need to suppress it. No need to deny it. Being with our breath helps to create inner space. Because we're no longer crowding our mind space with all these stories, with all these, you know, with, with the 10,000 things in the world. When we don't have a problem with someone, we find other stuff to occupy our mind. The 10,000 things in the world to keep ourselves busy. We say they're food for thoughts. But we're just really crowding up ourselves with things in order to distract ourselves so that we don't have to face what's there in our body, in our mind, what's there in the relationship. And so we suffer, we continue to suffer. And so when we are able to come to our breathing, we create space inside and we can just put that thing down. And when we can put that thing down temporarily, it helps us to look deeply into it. When we have enough space and distance from these issues, it helps us to see very clearly into it. It helps us to understand the situation. It's the understanding that transforms the situation. It's not about suppressing or denying. And for us, usually, it's about suppressing and denying. And you know that suppressing and denying is not the best way because they will come up again. You know, we have like, we have suffering in our childhood, enormous suffering, horrendous suffering. And because we didn't know how to take care of ourselves, we don't know how to articulate what we're feeling and what we were experiencing, we just deny and put it aside. 
And then when we grew up, these things continue to affect our life and our relationship and our way of looking at ourselves and at the world. You know, some people who were abused, sexually abused as a child, continues to suffer. And I was in a group with uh, this survival group, an incest survival group, and there were men, women in their 60s and 70s who cried like babies because all their lives they suffer so much because of that that incident, and they didn't know how to take care of themselves, and that suffering continues. So letting go means that we are we stay with our breath, we stay with our body, <clears throat> so that we have enough space in here to look into that issues. And if, we, if, if it's just a nagging feeling, we don't exactly know what it is, because sometimes this suffering can just come up as a nagging feeling, some discomfort, and we're not sure what it is. It's important to stay with that experience, with that nagging feeling, to see what it is that it wants to say to us. And that's a way to practice letting go. And once we are able to put down, it gives a lot of joy and a lot of happiness. So when we practice these ex two exercises, it's the practice of putting down, letting go, creating inner space so that we can, we can have the clarity in our mind to understand. And it's mindfulness that helps with putting it down. And if the environment is not very conducive in helping us to create inner space, maybe to step out of that environment temporarily so that you can have some distance and some space to deal with what you need to deal with inside. And another, another element that can really help us to cultivate joy and happiness are nature. I think the moment you come to Plum Village, even if you're coming for the first time and you're stepping into the, in, into, into Plum Village, even if you may not know the practice, but the nature here can just help you to feel so much calmer, so much more peaceful. So nature has that miraculous element, is that it, it gives joy, it brings happiness, it brings healing. So the seventh exercise is aware of feeling. You see, to be able to practice this exercise, to be aware of a feeling, like I've said, mental states are much more difficult to notice and to grasp than something that's more tangible. So it's important to always start with the breath. Feel the body. Then we can, we can go to the next one, which is to be aware of the feeling. Um, I've you know, I met people who's, um, who could not come in touch with their body. They don't really know what's happening in the body. They just couldn't. I guess they're, they're like experts in 
in the head, you know, running in ten direction, and, and, and they're just not be, not able to come in touch with their body. And if you can't come in touch with your body, no guarantee that you can come in touch with your feelings. And so, breathing in, I'm aware there's a feeling. What feeling is it that's in here right now? Is it a feeling of sadness? Is it a feeling of irritation? Of anger? Name it. Breathing out, I smile to it. It's a practice of near recognition, just simply recognizing it. There's no need to punish ourselves or to beat ourselves down, to criticize or judge ourselves. The practice, we always have to be really gentle with ourselves. Because if we can't accept ourselves, it means that we're rejecting ourselves. And for us to be able to transform it, we have to be able to acknowledge that it's there and accept it for what it is. That's the first step. For us to be able to understand it and transform it, we have to be able to acknowledge that, yes, there is a sadness, there is anger. And the eighth exercise is to take care, to calm or take care of feeling. So I have already shared with you how to take care of this block in your body because it's the feeling, feelings manifest on the body. And, and the best way to take care of it is to stay with that, with that experience in the body. Sometimes it comes up and you notice that it's coming up, this feeling, and just simply breathe with it and smile to it. Bring the energy of mindfulness to it so that the energy of mindfulness can embrace it. Sometimes it could be really uncomfortable. It takes training to do this, to do this well. Because we're so used to running away, we're so used to distracting ourselves from what is happening, from what is there. So we need to be really patient with ourselves and to trust that this breath that we're holding that we're using to hold this feeling will help to soothe that feeling, to soothe that experience that we are having in our body, in our mind. And we stay with it. We stay with that experience until it opens up our mind to some, to to this part that's really clear in ourselves. In other words, this feeling, it melts away. The intensity of that feeling or that emotion lessen, lessen to the point where we can be with it and it's not affecting us. We can be with it, we can look into it without being overwhelmed. So we, we use this practice with strong emotion as well with despair, with anger. And, um, and even with, with excitement. I, I used, when I came to Plum Village, uh, when I first came to Plum Village, and, and um, I realized that I go on extremes. Like there are times when I'm just so happy and so excited. I mean, I feel like I'm jumping for joy and you know, like, I feel like my body's bursting with joy and happiness. But then at another point, I go deep in my sadness, like this really deep sadness, and I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure what's the cause of this sadness, but really sad. At points, feeling really like a deep despair, like just that extremes of, I felt like I was in extreme of these emotions and feeling. 
And so it's not just about embracing, you know, the emotions, strong emotion that creates suffering and pain, such as like our anger or our sadness or despair, our guilt. But it's also being able, able to manage and to be with this like feeling of bursting, bubbling. Do you ever had that experience of like feeling like it's bubbling? You're know, like bubbling. Well, I have that, and I felt like it. It makes me very superficial. You know, because I'm. It's not coming from a place of peace and calm and clarity. And so both of these kind of emotions, we need to breathe with it. And it's, it's being with it that we helps us to understand deeper into ourselves. It helps us to be deep. It helps us to have this clarity to understand what it is that makes us like that. And so it's the same thing with anger. I think anger is an issue that we all struggle with at one point or another in our life. Some of us have received this seed from our ancestors, some from our parents, and it's just really, um, you know, like a really big piece of our life that creates a lot of suffering for ourselves and for our beloved ones. And how do we practice with our anger? We practice this, first of all, when we are in a situation that triggers our anger, it's important to create space by either stepping away, be with our breath. Step away is the best. For me, it's difficult for me to step away, but I always have to remember to step away. I step away and I avoid saying anything, confronting the issues that trigger my anger. Because I know when I am speaking from a place of anger and irritation, I'm not going to resolve the issues. I'm just going to escalate my anger and I'm just going to water the anger in the other person and we're just going to, you know, have this escalation of anger and things would only get worse. That is best that I don't say anything, that I create space inside by stepping out so that I can take care of this anger. Because when anger comes up, it feels like it's a fire, a ball of fire. It flares up and it burns us. And we're no longer ourselves. And so stepping away helps us to to take care of it, we listen to it, we take care, we breathe with it, like we are taking care of, of a wounded child in us. And it is actually a wounded child because this anger is not from the other person. The other person only play a condition that trigger the seed inside. The seed is already inside us, the seed of anger. And if we have a big seed of anger, then we can easily be triggered. And when it comes up, we think it's the other person that creates our, our, our anger. It's not. That person only plays the last drop of water to make this bowl overflow. The bowl of water overflow. overflow. So it's best to step away in order to create more suffering, in order to avoid saying things that we can regret later. See, for me, it's not what about it's not about what other persons say to me that creates suffering. It's what I say to the other person that later on eats my inside. It's really uncomfortable. So I'd rather not say anything that I would regret later and have to work with it later. Stepping away so that I can take care of this. So that I can understand where it is coming from and why. When I understand where my anger is coming from then I don't have to blame the other person. So I can have more compassion for myself and for the other person. I can have more compassion for myself because, you know, I'm a victim. 
of transmission. The seed has been passed on to me by my parent, the seed of anger. And that I'm, I'm a victim of the society as well. The seed has been watered by the society as I grew up, by my education, by my peers. And so I, I have more compassion for myself. I don't need to judge myself for being angry. And I don't need to judge the other person. He, that person plays a condition. Maybe that person has a lot of suffering herself. And her suffering has overflowed and had triggered my anger. So love and understanding are the antidote for anger. It's, like a, it's a soothing balm that helps to soothe our anger. And so that anger in us, the seed, is the wounded child expressed through anger. Our, the wounded child, every one of us have a wounded child in us. You know, as when during my early years, when I suffer, I would go up to that hill up there and spend time alone. Sometimes I cry a bit to the trees. And I looked into my anger, I embraced it and I breathed with it. And I realized that most of my suffering comes from when I was a child, when I was going through my teenage years. That's when I was most vulnerable. That's when I didn't know what to do with all these inputs. Inputs that may not be so pleasant and loving, and that may be watering the wrong seeds in me, the seeds of suffering in me, and I didn't know how to work with it. And, and it made me more compassionate with myself, more gentle with myself, that I don't really need to criticize myself and beat myself down. And it's, it's that understanding that slowly helps me to transform myself, transform that wounded child. And, um, and so if you, if you have children or teenage children, I have compassion for you. <laughs> uh, me and Sister Moon went to Italy, and we stayed with three families that had sponsored us and hosted us during the time we were in Italy. And they had children and teenage children. And I just like, oh my gosh, we were like discussing, it's like, we're just so lucky <laughs> that we're monastics <laughs> and we don't have any children. <laughs> I mean, children are cute, you know, like when they come in, they're like babies and we all want to play with them, but wait until they become teenagers. <gasps> and so we're like, Phew, such liberation not to have any <laughs> teenage children. And so that was like, a bell of mindfulness for us and just show us how, wow, we have chosen the right path <laughs> as monastics. <laughs> but, but, you know, you have to practice a lot in order to create an environment for them so that their seeds of suffering are not watered too much. And, uh, and every summer here in Plum Village, we have hundreds of children. Like in the, in the, uh, here with the English-speaking um, children program, we have sometimes up to 50, 60, 80 children. And not just children f you know, from 6 to 12, the children program, but we have like much younger children, babies and toddlers and infants. And every time I, they, they come here, even though they don't know the practice, and they're just running around talking and screaming and even during noble time and silent time. But it's actually okay. It's actually really good because they're bathing in this pool 
of love and peace. And all their good seeds are watered. And it made me so happy to see, to see that, that at least we have provided an environment where these children have a chance to, to have their good seeds watered. And later on in their life, maybe their experience here can help save their life. And there was one young man who came, and uh, he was from Switzerland. And he looked really peaceful, really calm. And I thought, wow, he looks like a monk. You know, like his energy and his presence. And then one day I asked him, why is it that you're so calm? And he said, I came to Plum Village when I was 10. I came with my parents. And, um, you know, that was like the first and the last time he came. And he said, um, even though I was just playing with my friends all the time, but when I went through, when I went to college, I had suffered a lot, a lot, a lot. I was hidden the bottom. And it was remembering what I had learned in Plum Village. It was just the breath that people was talking about, the breathing we people was talking about that had saved me. And it helped him to be so much calmer, so much clearer in himself. And it was such an inspiring story. And so our teenage years and our ch uh, childhood years have created suffering, a lot of suffering for us. And that there's this big wounded child in us. And that the only way to heal this wounded child is to really take good care of ourselves through these practices, the practice of the breath, being with the body, embracing our feelings, our emotions. And this is how we heal ourselves. This is how we become stronger. This is, this is a path that helps us to transform our suffering into joy, into happiness. And we become an instrument to help other people. We touch lives around us by being, just by being who we are with the practice, by practicing co to cultivate peace and joy. And I'm always intrigued by, um, by the practice of peace and love. And even if nobody knows that we're practicing, our presence in this world is affecting lives around us. And even if I am practicing in a cave in the Himalayas, nobody knows that I'm there. Nobody knows that I exist. But my presence with peace, with love, with understanding ripples out and it affects humanity. It affects the whole humanity. And so our practice here is not just for ourselves. Yes, of course, for ourselves, but not just for ourselves. Our practice this week, when we are cultivating peace, cultivating love, cultivating understanding, is affecting the whole humanity. Maybe at some time today, someone is struck by this light, this ripple of peace and love, and is able to smile for the first time. Is able to feel peace for the first time. So thank you for being here and for being a part of um, part of this journey to to wake up for ourselves 
and also to help with collective awakening of humanity. So let us listen to the three sounds of the bell and breathe with any one of the exercises that you like um, so that we can really be in our body and tap into peace, joy, and happiness in ourselves. <laughs> 